Think Forward. Think Research Channel. I have the opportunity and the pleasure uh, to introduce uh, our distinguished speaker today. Uh, our speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Murray, who is Professor of Pediatrics, Pediatric Dentistry, and Biological Sciences at the University of Iowa. Uh, and uh, the topic of his presentation uh, is Disorders of Newborn Infants, Bedside to Bench and Back. We often use that terminology. I think Dr. Murray is going to illustrate truly what that means. Let me uh, briefly describe uh, Dr. Murray's career. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree at MIT, uh, his medical degree at Tufts, uh, and then did his residency training in pediatrics at the New England Medical Center. He went on to fellowship training at the NIH and then at the University of Washington uh, in the Department of Medical Genetics. I notice in looking through uh, Dr. Murray's CV that he, in addition to having a distinguished record as a scientist, and he's going to share that with us, uh, I noticed in his CV, and it particularly impresses me, that he has won multiple resident and student education awards. Uh, and I also notice, and it also impresses me, that he has an ongoing clinic and he is ongoing, he's an ongoing attending physician uh, in the uh, inpatient rotation at the University of Iowa. Uh, we don't have too many triple threats anymore. And uh, our speaker today uh, continues to uh, demonstrate that uh, there are physicians who are physician scientists, great, edu great educators, uh, and great clinicians. And in fact, uh, among Dr. Murray's recognitions uh, is the fact that he is a member of the Institute of Medicine uh, of the National Academies. So we clearly have uh, a distinguished speaker who is the complete physician, physician, scientist, educator, and I'd like Dr. Murray to come up and for you to welcome him. I would like to uh, take the opportunity at the beginning of this talk uh, to make sure that Dr. Murray uh, knows we're appreciative of his visit uh, and that he remembers uh, us here in Kentucky. I'd like you to have this julep cup uh, so that you think about us. And uh, we're interested in listening to you. Well, uh, thank you for the present. Uh, I probably don't know it was my birthday two days ago. Oh. And uh, <laughs> my, mother for the first, it my, my mother for the first time ever forgot it. Um, or at least she, uh, she sent our, my daughter a birthday card whose birthday is the day after mine. And, uh, didn't send me one, but she did call me up on my birthday, so I, I, I have for, forgiven her for that, so it's really nice to get the, the gift. Um, for, I mean, first of all, thanks um, particularly to the Dean and to Charlie Lutz for inviting me um, to come and to give a talk. I really appreciate the opportunity. I've been incredibly fortunate in my career and um, being able to do work that I really enjoy, and I actually don't think of myself at all as a triple threat, but as sort of a being triply average. Um, since I'm not able to invest a full amount of time in any one of the particular pursuits. But I have been really lucky and I really enjoy what I do and what I hope to do today is to convey to you um, both a little bit of the clinical aspects and the scientific aspects of the work that we've been involved in. I'm going to do this in I think sort of four parts. I'm going to give a little bit of a general introduction kind of about genetics and the genome project, sort of how we approach the questions that we're interested in. 
I'm going to then talk about two particular disorders that we've studied, one for a long time, which is cleft lip and palate, and I'll present a fair amount of data on that, and then some recent studies that we've just gotten involved in in the last five years, which in involve uh, preterm birth and genetic predispositions to preterm labor and the complications of preterm labor. And then uh, at the very end, I'm, and I'll try to work the timing on this so that I can do it appropriately, at the very end I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of social just, justice aspects of research and medicine as well. Um, I know you all have a terrific lunch out there. It's really frustrating as a speaker to see this great lunch and not be able to eat in front of you, so I hope you're enjoying that. Um, just to warn you, um, I am going to have uh, two short quizzes that will take place during the course of the talk today, um, so you need to be ready to answer those when I ask the questions. I'm conducting a survey in one case and a, I guess a kind of a public health uh, teaching in the other, and then as I said, I'm going to give a little bit of a sort of sermon at the end, so I'll uh, be prepared for that as well. Um, so that's the title. Um, so this, I probably won't be able to read the small print, but this sort of captures my uh, career in, in genetics. I first remember when I was in 10th grade biology, my biology pe teacher, Mr. Pine, was incredibly excited that within just the last few years, um, they had identified the proper number of chromosomes that human beings had, and that for the first time we could count chromosomes and tell whether somebody had Down syndrome or trisomy 21 or um, trisomy 18 or trisomy 13. And it's the first time that I can remember historically that I was really excited about both the science aspects of genetics as well as the medical aspects of genetics and sort of the bringing of those two things together. Um, when I was in college, I had a part-time job working um, in a lab that at the time was trying to build a gene using organic chemistry. And after about uh, something like 40 postdoc years, they were able to build a 75 base pair long transfer RNA. And I got to play a very, very tiny role in, in sort of helping with some of that work. And it was during that time that I really got interested in DNA and the power of DNA and the uses of DNA. Um, as you heard, I then, you know, uh, went to medical school, finished my residency. I actually oscillated back and forth throughout medical school and residency as to whether I wanted to be a primary care physician or to have a kind of an academic and a research-oriented career. Um, I did a fellowship um, in Seattle with uh, uh, Arnold Matulski, who was an internist, but who really taught me, I think, two things. One was about the sort of broader world social aspects of medicine and science. Um, he actually testified and um, acted as sort of a judge in absentia for a trial that was held of uh, Adolf Mengele, who was one of the physicians who worked in the um, Holocaust camps um, during World War II. And Dr. Matulski had been a Jewish refugee from Germany, and I remember him speaking very eloquently about um, the interface between science and politics and, and how physicians can not only do good but to do bad as well. Um, it was during that time that I got reinterested in sort of genetics and chromosomes, and the little picture up here actually shows that it was right at the time that we were making a transition from being able to study genes in humans at the chromosomal level to being able to do it at the DNA and the DNA sequence level. And in the mid-1980s, I moved to Iowa. I've been there ever since. I've had a really amazingly good time. I still have a job that I really like, and I mean, there's probably less than 5% of my time that I want to complain about what I do, although um, I certainly can occasionally find things to complain about, as I'm sure all of you can. So what I'm going to try and do is give just, a, again, this little bit of background on genetics and then uh, sort of get into the meat of this. Um, the little baby that's on your right up there is a child that I saw um, in 1983. You can see the little A83 on the tag on the chest indicating it was an autopsy that was done in 1983. And at that time, this was a baby who died immediately after birth. And we suspected clinically, and this, I think, for those of you, the medical students and the residents in the audience, you know that clinical skills and clinical judgment um, is still absolutely critical to being able to do science. And you know, being here in Lexington, where people like Jackie Noonan and Brian Hall really established um, genetics as such a central component to not only pediatrics but to medicine in general, I think really reminds certainly me and I hope all of us of the importance of phenotyping and clinical identification and clinical skills in the work that we do, not only in the clinic where it's obvious to, you know, write it on the face of it, but also for the interface with um, science as well. On the left-hand side there is shown uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization, um, that technique that we now have the ability to very, very rapidly, just within a few hours, 
at least count the number of chromosomes, and we're in the process now of moving to even higher resolution um, molecular chromosomal techniques such as CGH or comparative genomic hybridization, which have really given us, you know, a really unthought of power to analyze genetics in a clinical sense far beyond what Mr. Pine was excited about um, with me back in 1965 and just counting the numbers of chromosomes. So I think this, this interface between how the science and the technology enables us to be more effective clinically, but at the same time that the clinic drives us to look for the science and to try and find better ways to help our patients is a really important one to entertain. Um, just a little bit of background on the Human Genome Project, and I won't turn this into a human genome lecture, um, but we've been really lucky in my lifetime and 10 years to see three major advances as well as one area of emphasis that relate to the Human Genome Project. The first was its ability in humans first and subsequently in a large number of comparative organisms to actually establish the sequence. So, those of you in this room who are just entering, you know, school or residency will never live in a time where we don't know essentially the whole sequence of the human genome. When I was a resident, we didn't even think that that would be something that would be possible within our lifetimes. And that really gives us a tremendous ability to move scientific investigations in a genetic sense very, very rapidly ahead because we know what the reference is. We know what to sort of look at and we know what to compare it to when, we, when we're looking for differences that might cause disease. Um, in addition, as I mentioned, there's also now the sequences of approximately 20 other higher vertebrate organ organisms who have genomes on the approximate size of ours, several billion nucleotides in length, and we can compare the sequence of those, and that's really critical for identifying those regions of the genome that are important. All of us would know and suspect that things like protein coding sequences, genes as we think of them classically, are important and will be conserved, both at the amino acid and the nucleotide level, but about twice as much sequence is found outside of those coding regions that's also conserved across organisms. This is presumed to play a role in regulatory functions and has given us a whole new tool to try and identify critical regions of a genome that can be mutated in a disease. Um, the third thing that's really important is in the last couple of years has been the not only discovery but really the uh, publication of a huge number of what are called SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are individual changes in a DNA sequence that are found commonly across the population. Um, you and the person sitting next to you have several million differences in your DNA sequence. They're the things that make us human, so those differences are the things that separate us as human individuals and are responsible for all of the variability that you can see in a room, the common variability looking around a room like this in terms of hair color and eye color and skin color and behaviors and all the things that are genetically um, determined. And in the last couple of years, these have really been cataloged and made available for usage, and you can now study hundreds of thousands of these for literally a couple of hundred dollars. And this has, again, given us a whole new tool for carrying out genetic studies at a very, very high level of resolution to participate in gene finding. And then um, there's been a lot of advocacy. Um, Jim Watson was the person who first started the, at least the NIH-funded uh, component of the Genome Project in the U.S., and he was uh, very clever in ensuring that the project not only investigated the science, but also investigated the ethical, legal, and social aspects of medicine. And although I'm not going to talk about these very much today, these have really played a critical role in how we think about medicine and science as well, and I think it's been um, equally important to the science to have the ability to try and understand the implications of the science as well, and certainly a lesson that we should have learned um, over many other scientific enterprises in the past. Um, so, you know, why do genetics? You know, why, why does somebody like me think that this is important or spend time on it? Well, one of the obvious reasons is etiology, coming up with an explanation for things. But an etiology in and of itself isn't necessarily the be-all and end-all. In fact, it's often just a step on a longer path. It can be very reassuring and helpful to parents to know that their child has Down syndrome or cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia, but that fact in and of itself doesn't affect the treatment or the outcome unless we can apply it in some way. It's also useful for making pre-symptomatic diagnoses, being able to anticipate that somebody's likely to develop a condition, particularly where there may be treatment protocols or preventive protocols that might delay the onset of that particular disorder. It allows us to identify previously unknown physiologic paths for more intense investigations scientifically. Um, a really big component of this is that it allows us to examine what's called pharmacogenetics or pharmacogenomics. Um, I think this is a 
promise probably still waiting to be fully fulfilled, but it at least affords us the promise that at some point in the future we'll be able to target um, medications and therapies at the specific individual down at the bottom, this so-called personalized medicine, so that drugs and their drug metabolism that varies between individuals based on their genetic background can now be taken into account when one is prescribing a medication, either in terms of its dose or the specificity of a medication. And then genetics are really important covariates in environmental studies, and I'll try to show um, in a couple of things that I talk about today um, that the environment is certainly at least equally important to genetics as we think about disorders. Okay, um, complex traits. So the two disorders that I'll spend most of my time talking about today um, are complex traits. These means, mean that they're common or at least relatively common and typically that they're caused by more than one gene and or environmental trigger. So those things sort of acting together. And again, I'm going to use as examples work that we've done on cleft lip and palate and on prematurity to sort of talk about how you can think about these in the laboratory and to give at least a couple of examples of how we've tried to move some of that um, into the clinic and we hope eventually coming from the clinic back to the lab in a continuously iterative process that will enable us to continue to provide both better care for people, the, the primary goal, as well as to develop a better understanding of what it is that we're, what we're doing. Um, I really like this slide. It came from an article a few years ago in the Journal of Medical Genetics, and it really just shows this sort of gradient between things that are fully genetic or almost fully genetic to fully environmental, and then the sort of transmission in between, and things that are polygenic or certainly what multifactorial, although this is a term sort of falling out of favor, but multifactorial is this intersection between multiple genes and mu multiple environmental factors leading to a disorder. And most of the common things, high blood pressure, asthma, most cancers, mental health, uh, mental illness, all these kinds of things probably fall in this region here. And there's probably almost nothing that's completely environmental. So, you know, even exposures to, you know, toxins probably have at least some genetic component of how they're metabolized and excreted that play a role in a person's response. And even disorders like sickle cell anemia or cystic fibrosis that are caused by single genes do not have their phenotype or clinical manifestations determined only by the genetics of that single gene. They're also modified by both environment and by other genes. So the challenge facing people like ourselves who want to investigate complex traits is to try and tease out the genes in the environment and um, because there are multiple factors involved that creates some challenges. Um, in pediatrics we like to think of this as kind of a, an, an ideal study design or an ideal family. One of the things that um, challenges us uh, certainly with um, things like birth defects and preterm labor is that we're not even sure whether all of the risk lies just in the infant from a genetic perspective or whether some of that risk might lie in the mother as well. So for things like preterm labor, you could certainly imagine that genetic triggers could lie in the fetus and the placenta, or they could also lie in the mother and her uterus. So you sort of have to be prepared to look at both. For birth defects, cleft lip and palate being example, certainly the genetics could lie in the fetus who's affected with that birth defect, but where environmental factors are a component, it could also lie in not only the exposure that the mother has environmentally, but also the genetic determinants of her metabolism and the role that that might play. So we're very invested in trying to develop study designs like this where we collect three generations with multiple affected individuals, whether we consider the affected the mothers or the fetuses, and then looking at their outcomes. And one particular study design we use is something called the transmission disequilibrium test where we look to see in a parent who's heterozygous, so has two different alleles within a particular gene, as to whether one of these is transmitted more than the 50-50 prediction that Mendel's laws would make into an infant or a fetus who's affected with a particular trait. So if the A allele here was predisposing to preterm labor, in a family that looked like this, you would expect to see a higher proportion of AB preterm babies than BB preterm babies where Mendel's laws would predict 50-50. And this can be a very powerful study design for teasing out effects. And you can consider this risk to be either the, the infant, the fetus itself, or this could also be the mother. It could be that it's the mother's risk that you're looking at here. So we, we try to exploit this study design in any sample collection that we're doing. Of course, we're lucky in pediatrics because parents and grandparents are often available and interested in being involved. Well, I was really fortunate to get interested in cleft lip and palate actually first when I was a medical student and subsequently as a resident and a fellow. 
And I've been interested in it both clinically and also from uh, etiology and as you'll see in a, in a little bit from a kind of prevention and treatment perspective as well. Um, this is an older little girl that I saw in the Philippines. I, again, was very lucky to be able to start going on some uh, medical uh, mission work there in the mid-1980s and through an organization called Operation Smile. There's a number of these volunteer medical groups that uh, play a role in providing treatment in indigent populations for older children and, again, as you'll see later, sometimes even adults. It's a really interesting problem. It involves multidisciplinary care and, it, and it's also um, a complex trait and I became interested in it both from a clinical perspective, as I said, and also from uh, the perspective of, of the care that needs to be provided. Uh, child with cleft lip, there's a cleft of the palate. Um, one of the things that's uh, interesting about this is that most of these cases can be divided into two very general categories. About a third, 30% or so, are what are called syndromic. This means they're caused by chromosome abnormalities, drug exposures, uh, single gene disorders, et cetera. And there's well over 400 of those that have been described. So individually, these are quite rare. But most cases, about 70%, are what are called non-syndromic. So these kids don't have any other syndromic features. They don't have mental retardation. They don't have congenital heart disease. They don't have extra toes or fingers. They just have the cleft lip and palate. And in these cases, about clefts of the lip or the lip and palate together occur in about one in 1,000 live births. Cleft palate only is about one in 2,500, although these frequencies vary by things like geography, socioeconomic status, and family history. And for all of them, once you've had one child, this being the sort of population risk, your risk for having a second child is about one in 30. So there's a huge increase in risk, and this as well as twin studies and other data have strongly supported that genetics plays a role in this recurrence. And we've used that to our advantage to try to identify individual genes that might be involved. There's a number of different ways in which one can try and investigate the kinds of genes that play a role in complex diseases. You can use what are called candidate genes. These are genes that may be um, abnormal in an animal model of your disorder, a rat that has hypertension, for example, or a fruit fly that's got an eye abnormality, <clears throat> or how those genes are expressed is another way to look at this, so the tissue or the organ that they're expressed in. You can do it by um, location, so a chromosomal translocation can lead to a disorder or a phenomena called linkage where we do family studies to map or find the position of a disorder on a chromosome can be used. You can use something called single gene models where you find a syndrome that includes that phenotype as part of the syndromic features and finding its cause in a particular gene and then using that gene to study the more common forms. And then finally, something that really just in the last six months to a year has really become feasible, which is something called genome-wide association, where if there's a common variant in a gene somewhere in the genome predisposing to a disorder, you can identify that now by studying hundreds or even thousands of cases using a panel of a half a million or so of these single nucleotide polymorphisms, which study genetic variation across the entire human genome and where you can compare frequencies of alleles between case and control populations. And I won't go into too much detail on that, but I think this really is going to revolutionize at least one component of the way in which we search for genetic disorders. Um, the strategy that we've used to use genetics as a tool in cleft lip and palate has been through sample collection. Again, I mentioned Operation SMILE. We've either collected ourselves or in uh, really nice collaborations that we have in the Philippines and Denmark and Norway and elsewhere, now more than 12,000 um, samples from families and individuals with cleft lip and palate including several thousand um, samples just from affected individuals. And we collect both families and individual cases, and as you'll see, this has given us a couple of different opportunities for ways in which we can investigate the genetics. Um, one study that we do is pretty simplistic in its design, although it's pretty high risk, and that is we do um, candidate gene sequencing. So we pick genes based on expression or animal models as likely to play a role in cleft lip and palate. And we do, we do DNA sequencing of those, of the coding regions and of the conserved regions. And we've done uh, such a study now on almost about 50 genes. We use about 180 cases for the sequencing. We're able to use our family studies to confirm some of the results. And then if we find results in this relatively modest number of cases, you know, less than 200, we can then look for the prevalence of those mutations in much larger case series once we know where to look. And I, I won't go through all of the um, work by us and by others that's kind of shown below, but quite a number of genes now have been identified as playing a role in 
cleft lip and palate, each of these just playing a small role. But I will give two recent examples from our lab that we're um, pretty enthusiastic about. So one of them is a, in a gene called uh, BMP4, bone morphogenetic protein 4. Um, this is part of uh, cell signaling pathways and has been shown by Jim Martin and actually others to play a role in a lot of different components of embryogenesis, limb development, heart development, but also in lip development. And a couple of years ago, um, Jim and his group showed that in mice who had um, a conditional knockout of the BMP4 gene, that there was a point during their development where they seemed to have um, a cleft of the lip, which you can see down here. But by the time these mice get to term, so this is present around 14 days gestation in the mouse, by the time these mice get to term, it appears as though this particular cleft has, has healed or has gone away. And uh, in talking with Jim, we were really intrigued by this because um, it's been no, well known in humans, and I've seen and many other people have seen quite a number of cases of people who are born looking like this. So this is a woman who was born like this. It looks as though she's had surgery done, but in fact, she was born with what appears to be a healed scar in her lip in a position where a cleft would be. So based on this finding, we thought maybe this is involved in lip development. So we undertook a pretty extensive study looking at first about 85 patients who had this microform, and we found either nonsense or missense mutations in three of those people, and then in a larger collection of about 1,000 people with cleft lip and palate and we found mutations in five of those. We didn't find any missense or nonsense mutations in a little over 500 controls that we looked at. And this p-value by itself is at least you know, significant, although not wildly significant. Several of these mutations, again, nonsense mutations and the like, are clearly ones that are disruptive of gene function. So we think although these numbers are small, you know, less than a percent or so, they are at least making some contribution to one of the causes for cleft lip and palate. Um, a second larger group of genes that we've been looking at, and this is mostly work that's been done by Bridget Riley, who's a graduate student in the lab, has been to um, study the FGF genes, the fibroblast growth factor genes, and their receptors. There's a lot of evidence, both in human and animal models, that these might uh, play a role in clefting. They're involved in uh, very complex intracellular signaling paths, as is sort of illustrated over here. A couple of, of human syndromes, Kalman syndrome, which is associated with anosmia or the inability to smell and infertility also includes cleft lip and palate in about 5 to 10 percent of patients. Some of the craniosynostosis syndromes including Apert syndrome have high rates of cleft palate and both of these are caused by mutations in FGF receptors, one for Kalman syndrome and two for Apert syndrome. And then there's quite a number of animal models, both hypomorphs and gene knockouts that result in abnormal lip or palate development and they're sort of illustrated down here. So Bridget undertook a pretty extensive uh, study where she's done a number of different things. The sequencing that I kind of talked about previously, she's also done some association work and look at gene-gene interactions that I won't talk about. And then with uh, Musa Mohammadi um, in New York, she's begun to look at some protein structure function relationships. So she's looked at that group of FGFs and um, FGFR genes and, in essence, sequenced all of the coding and splice site regions of those genes, as well as a number of uh, sequence conserved regions outside of coding. This is one of only a few, I promise, slides that are completely incomprehensible from, from the back. But basically all this shows is that um, we found um, seven different uh, genes in which we found one or more mutations in coding sequence and never found mutations in any of those regions in a thousand or more controls. And in the aggregate, this is, um, again, quite a significant finding. Some of the molecular modeling tools support that these mutations themselves are damaging. Some of them are, I'll show you a couple of them, some of them are also very compelling in that they're de novo mutations, so they show up only in the patient and the parents don't have the mutation, so they've arisen in a child with a cleft where the parents are unaffected and have normal sequences. And I'll just show you really quickly two examples. This is one in the FGF8 gene. Um, this mutation occurs in a very strongly conserved amino acid sequence. I mentioned this enormous amount of uh, comparative sequence data that's available that can be converted into amino acid sequence as well. And you can see in this portion of the FGF8 gene, there's um, very, very strong amino acid sequence conservation. So this is predicted to be a very destructive um, change, and it occurs right at the site um, where the ligand and the receptor would be touching each other. So it's also modeled to be um, very important um, in contact points. And so we think there's at least good indirect biological evidence that it's etiologic, as well as the fact that in this particular family it's a de novo mutation. 
And then a second very interesting family that has a mutation in the FGFR1 gene. This is a nonsense mutation, so sort of uh, direct evidence that it's likely to be gene inactivating. And this was a family that um, I initially saw when this little, I initially saw this little girl when she was about 10 years old and uh, diagnosed her as having an isolated cleft lip or palate, no other features, no other structural abnormalities, normal intelligence. Um, her father also had a, a cleft lip um, and we saw him and again, no other features of him. And they'd had, a, the father had had an aunt who had died um, previously but who also had a cleft. So a fairly strong history of clefting in the family and we included this family in the sequence studies that um, Bridget was doing and found this nonsense mutation. And when we found it in the FGFR1 gene because mutations in that gene were known to call its Kalman syndrome, which as I said is associated with infertility and anosmia, we went back to the family. It was about 10 years later and the girl was in her early 20s and we met with them again and we learned several remarkable and I guess important lessons. One is that your phenotyping is never finished on a family. New things can always turn up and certainly in my case you don't always do as thorough a job as you wish you would have done. So when we talked to this family we had uh, several things that came up. One was that they recalled that when she was about eight or nine years old, the family was in a car driving together and they drove over a, a dead skunk and everybody in the family remarked on the smell of the skunk and she was the only person to, that uh, didn't know what they were talking about. So that was kind of a, a humorous uh, identification that she probably couldn't smell. Too serious and actually as it turns out life-threatening reason which we actually used with our IRB to allow us to go back and recontact families was that when she was about 12 she was babysitting for a family for two little kids and she made them macaroni and cheese for dinner and uh, when the parents came back at the end of the evening they walked in the house and immediately started screaming at her that she'd left the gas on in the oven and in fact she had but she had no idea what they were talking about because of course she couldn't smell it. Um, the family actually refused to pay her um, because of their uh, irateness over her leaving the gas on and we actually offered to write to the family to explain to them that they really owe her that uh, babysitting money since it wasn't her fault that she couldn't smell. But uh, you know it's humorous but also you know certainly of uh, particular interest. So she actually does have features of Kalman syndrome. She also um, has irregular periods. But her dad who we've examined again has no features whatsoever, is clearly fertile. He's passed on um, his genes to at least two of his kids. So there's a wide range of expression in these mutations and so the lesson is that sometimes syndromes may mask as non-syndromes because of the type of expression that they have. Um, the next story that I'll tell is about a, a disorder called Vanderwood syndrome. This is a single gene syndromic form of cleft lip and palate. It's an autosomal dominant and it's characterized by people who have sort of very typical um, cleft lip and palate, it's sort of illustrated here. And this is not a great picture because these indentations in the lower lip have not been caused by these incisors. These have been present since birth. And the only thing that distinguishes this autosomal dominant condition from the isolated or non-syndromic form of clefting is the observation of these lip pits, which are found in about 85% of family members who have this. Very clear-cut autosomal dominant and we spent about 10 years with Brian Schutte and Teresa Zaccaro and Mary Marazita trying to find the specific gene for this because the phenotype of this overlapped so much with the isolated form of clefting, we thought that finding the gene for this syndromic form might tell us something about the paths involved in clefting. So we mapped it here. We used some interesting twins that I won't talk about to actually find the gene. And eventually we were able to show that it was um, caused by mutations in a transcription factor called interferon regulatory factor six. There's nine members of this family. This is kind of an orphan member that's involved in facial development. Um, a lot of the mutations are truncation, nonsense mutations, a bunch more are missense mutations. Um, and then in the process of now looking at over 300 families, we also found one family, or not one family, many families had an amino acid change right here, a valine to isoleucine change that was found in anywhere from 3% of normal Caucasians to up to 30% of Asians and South Asians. And because this was a very highly conserved amino acid, it's valine in all the other family members at this site, as well as in all the other species with IRF6 data, we thought even though valine to isoleucine is not a big time amino acid change, that it might have a subtle effect on gene function <clears throat> that could be predisposing to the isolated form of clefting. So we looked at that now in a very large study that a graduate student, Teresa Sicaro, did. She looked at over 8,000 people, more than 1,900 families, and she found highly, highly significant overtransmission of the valine allele into affected people in those families. 
it's been subsequently replicated independent of our group by five other groups as well. And in the aggregate, this um, suggests that this particular variant, or at least a variant associated with this, um, explains about 12% of isolated cleft lip and palate, or at least it's got a 12% attributable risk. And it changes the recurrence in families who have this from about a 3% recurrence risk to about a 9% recurrence risk. So this was the first time that we found something that we thought was making uh, at least a substantial contribution to isolated cleft lip and palate. Um, as I said, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the environment in clefting, and <clears throat> bad camel over here has been um, you know, selling cigarettes to teenagers in the U.S. for many years, and although he's out of business in the U.S., he's still very active overseas. <clears throat> and besides smoking having been shown as a presumed risk for cleft lip and palate, <clears throat> each of these other factors have been associated with it as well. And so we had a graduate student in the lab who wanted to investigate this. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, I'm in. Uh, <clears throat> Min Shi was a graduate student in the lab, and we had um, <clears throat> two very large populations, one from Denmark and one from Iowa. Uh, they were good populations because we could study them independently, and at the same time we thought that they actually were closely related to one another. <clears throat> um, Denmark obviously is Northern European, and actually most of Iowa's settlers come from England, Germany, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Norway, so the populations of both are very Northern European. And environmentally, they're similar. They're both surrounded by water. Um, Denmark is surrounded by uh, the North Sea and the Baltic Sea, and I was surrounded by the Missouri River and the Mississippi River. So we thought that they had homogeneous environments as well. Um, Min uh, undertook it to look at the effects of smoking in the mother and then um, detoxification genes, either phase one, phase two, or some orphan members. And she looked at a total of about um, 16 different genes and multiple polymorphisms or SNPs in each of these genes to see if she could see whether there were any interactive effects between the mom smoking and um, the outcome in the fetus. And I won't drag you through all of her data. This is in press and it will be published in the next month or two. Um, but she found a very, very positive association both in Denmark and in Iowa significantly and independently that when the data was combined, it was very, very significant. And the effect is that if the mother smokes, and in particular if she smokes, there's a gradient, but if in particular the highest risk is that if the mom smokes more than 15 cigarettes a day, and if the fetus is null for a glutathione transferase theta polymorphism, and these GST null polymorphisms are actually pretty common. They affect about 25% of the population. Um, her odds ratio um, goes up to about 20 to 1. So a very, very huge increase in her odds ratio for having a child with a cleft. Raises her risk to about 1 in 50 um, in a, on a population basis. Um, she also found a second um, N-acetyl transferase gene was also overtransmitted into the fetus very highly significantly as well. But the remarkable finding for us was this association with smoking, which we were really um, interested to see. And for the first time, at least in a common birth defect, this interaction between what the mother does and what the fetus's genotype is. Um, I'm, I'm going to shift for a couple of minutes to talk briefly about um, two clinical trials that we've gotten involved in. And this will be the first test question that you'll have. Um, so I got interested in this largely out of having worked in the area of cleft lip and palate and having gone overseas for more than 20 years to participate in um, care of kids overseas and becoming, I guess, increasingly frustrated with the successes that we felt we were having in the lab, um, but the recognition that none of those successes were transferring directly to people like this, adults in many cases who still didn't have repairs of their clefts because of lack of resources in um, less developed countries. Um, so two projects that I'll describe have both sort of come out of, I guess, our interest in trying to do something that has more direct application. I remain very excited and enthusiastic about our science, but uh, I think it's nice to be able to try and do something more directly. So the first test question is, I want you to raise your hand if yesterday you took a, any kind of vitamin or pill that contained 400 micrograms of folic acid or more. So standard multivitamin kind of pill. So raise your hand if you took one yesterday. Okay, so you're really good. So now raise your hand if you didn't. <clears throat> yes, it's actually a little better than average. That's about 50-50. If you're a woman of childbearing age, and I can see that all the women in this audience are, um, 
And whether you're planning to have a kid or not, since half of pregnancies are unplanned, you have to be taking this because you know that it prevents neural tube defects very um, powerfully. And if you're a grown up like me and you're not having any more kids, it's probably good for you in lots of other ways as well. So people should be taking folic acid. And if you don't do anything as a result of hearing this lecture today other than A, starting to take folic acid, and B, telling your five closest friends that they should also take it, and if those five friends tell five friends, and it stops there, I will have prevented one child from being born with a neural tube defect sometime in the future. So please make my lecture a success by starting yourself, telling five friends, and getting them to tell five friends, and there's going to be one less kid with a neural tube defect sometime in the future. So this works both as occurrence prevention and recurrence prevention in neural tube defects. And there's been some suggestive data that this might work in clefts as well. So this has led us to two of the studies that we're doing. Um, the first one doesn't have anything to do with folic acid. This is a study that's overseen by Ed Castigia in um, uh, South America. He's in Argentina, but we're in about 10 different countries. And this was an attempt to see if we could train pediatricians to provide better and more aggressive care to kids born with clefts in the first month of life and if that could then serve to decrease their mortality by presumably enabling the parents to be more effective in delivering feedings and nutrition. As you can imagine, kids with clefts, especially severe clefts, can't form a normal suction around a nipple or a, a bottle nipple, and as a result of this, they often starve to death in indigent populations where families don't have resources. But they can actually be spoon-fed, or milk can be dribbled in, or it can be squirted in, and they can still swallow perfectly normally and survive. And so we've um, trained about um, 70 different pediatricians to teach parents this over the first month of life. And we've just completed the first arm of the study. And the preliminary data looks like we've, like, as if we've dropped mortality by about 15% in this population of some 70 different hospitals. And then we have a second project that's still ongoing looking at the impact of this on growth and cognition. And we won't have outcome data for that for another year or so. But at least we've made a first step in trying to provide some general training to improved outcomes. And then the second study has uh, just gotten underway a couple of years ago. It's a very large study. It involves about 5,000 women. We hope to ha eventually have about 16,000 case years, looking to see whether we can prevent recurrences of cleft lip and palate in those women who've already had one child with a cleft. We studied it about two years ago. We've just gotten our funding to go for the next five years, which should enable us to complete it. Um, we're using two arms. One is the basic dose that every mom should take, 400 micrograms a day. And then the second dose, the trial arm, is 4 milligrams a day, which has been shown to be effective in neural tube defects. And we're powered to detect about a 50% reduction in cleft lip and palate. And we're hopeful that this will put to rest the controversy that's existed, at least in our field, over whether this is an effective preventative treatment or not. And this is being overseen by uh, Danilo Moretti Ferreira there. Um, so sort of the interim summary, uh, we've at least begun to find some of the genes involved in cleft lip and palate begun to look at some uh, gene environment interactions, and then we're trying to take some of the functional correlates to the clinic. One of the things we'll do in the folate clinical trial that I failed to mention is to also look at folate gene um, uh, polymorphisms in the mom to see if there may be subsets of women who are more or less susceptible to um, the folic acid intervention. Okay, in the next um, 10 minutes, I'm going to quickly go through some studies that we're doing on prematurity and then um, give the little uh, uh, sermon at the end. So prematurity is a huge problem. There's about 500,000 kids a year in the US born with prematurity. It's one of the few disorders, probably like type 2 diabetes, that's genuinely increasing. So this is a 10-year period from 94 to 2004. And after a couple of decades of preterm births percentages dropping, it's going up. And there's a number of potential explanations for this, although the real reason is not is yet known. Lots of health disparities associated with this, much higher rates in African Americans. Interestingly, even when one controls for SES, it still is more common in African Americans. There's about 5 million deaths worldwide from uh, perinatal problems, most of those um, either prematurity or hypoxia um, shortly after birth and term kids a year. 5 million kids a year, and many of these are preventable deaths. For many years, there's been a disproportionate um, discrepancy in NIH's funding for disorders that relate to infants and children. So this is um, the component of what are called disability-adjusted life years. So this is the limitation that you have in being able to have a productive work life 
worldwide based on these disorders. So diabetes is about um, 20 million a year, and HIV, 20 million a year, and alcoholism, and so on, all the way up to perinatal disorders, which are almost 100 disability-adjusted life years a year. Again, most of this is prematurity. And of course, this is because these disorders all affect people well into their working lives whereas these disorders affect people even before they began to work and the deaths prevent people from ever working in general. And if you look at how much money NIH puts into it, it's this much, and this is just about the lowest amount and it's you know, one-tenth of what HIV is even though the proportional impact is much, much greater of this. In no way am I trying to suggest that HIV and diabetes and alcoholism and cardiovascular disease are not important disorders. They are, they're incredibly important, they're all the important. But we really think that some effort needs to go into this since we can provide real opportunities um, for preventing things in people. So very quickly, um, it's a complex trait much like cleft lip and palate. It's got both uh, genetic components and environmental components. Um, again, bad camel uh, in influences this. Uh, smoking is one of the biggest recognized risk factors for prematurity, but there's a whole list of other environmental components. And our goal is to see how these might interact with genetic factors, so alcohol, nutrition, infection, geography, social class, and so on. Um, there's a very strong evidence that genetics does play a role. Probably about 40% of preterm delivery from two large twin studies relates to genetics. Uh, your increase increases if the mom was born as a preemie, if she's had a previous preemie. In fact, that's the biggest risk for having a preemie, that is the mom having had a previous preemie. Sisters of moms who had a preemie are, have an increased risk racial predispositions, as I mentioned. And interestingly, post-term deliveries also aggregate in families. So there's probably genetic regulation of parturition in general and the onset of parturition in general. So we're trying to apply the same kind of approach to prematurity that um, we've been able to begin to apply in cleft lip and palate. So we have two groups that we're studying um, right now. One is a uh, Iowa repository that we started at our hospital in 1999. We offer enrollment to every family who comes into our uh, neonatal intensive care units and now to normal infants as well to participate in a repository study where they would donate cord blood from the baby as well as uh, blood or saliva samples from the parents. About 75% of our families that are approached um, accept and we've got almost 1,200 families in the study now where we have DNA from the mom and, or from the, mom and the baby and, and uh, most frequently from the dad as well. And then we're also collaborating with this wonderful study that was done in Denmark between 1998 and 2002 where they followed 96,000 mothers consecutively beginning in the first trimester, so at about 12 weeks um, gestation, well before those moms knew what the outcome of their pregnancy was going to be. They've collected blood samples on the mom throughout pregnancy and afterwards, blood samples on the babies afterwards. They have stored serum and a huge battery of epidemiologic nutritional surveys and so on. So it's a really unbiased population cohort study that's got about 5,000 premature infants in it. And we're also using that for some case control studies. Um, we're using this candidate gene approach that I've sort of discussed already. And then we're looking at both preterm labor and the genetics of that. And also um, trying to extend that to uh, outcomes of prematurity as well. And, I'll just give a couple of brief examples of some preliminary data that we have. So we've studied um, a first group of about 440 preterm infants, 312 of these come from singleton pregnancies. We treat them in the analysis differently from the twins, and we've studied about 70 genes so far with um, 170 of these SNPs. And I'm going to present two real brief, so this is the second slide that's incomprehensible. Uh, but the bottom line here is that there are about um, 700 comparisons across the baseline for different genes and different SNPs in those genes, and then um, uh, significance values shown up along the side. We've looked at different gestational ages as well as pools of all gestational ages. And the bottom line is there's a lot of noise of 700 signals down here, and then a few signals that sort of creep up here, and then a few that are, you know, very high that stand up well above the baseline. And I'll, I'll talk about just a couple of those, in, or just one of those in a little bit more detail. Um, this is the data for the progesterone receptor. So progesterone is known to prevent recurrences of preterm labor through the use of 17-hydroxy progesterone. And if we look in the fetus and singleton births only, we got some quite significant p-values for several of these are the SNP numbers in, located in the progesterone receptor gene. So we were sort of very encouraged by this preliminary data. 
and we've done um, some formal, more formal statistical analysis on it, and the data that we have so far is right at the borderline of being statistically significant, even when you take into account all of the multiple tests that we've done. People know that there's this functional progesterone withdrawal that occurs right around the time of birth, and so it's conceivable that the receptor, which has two isoforms, may be involved in mediating that process, and we're now in the process of looking at gene expression at both the RNA and the protein level to see if we can correlate that with genotype. So we're kind of excited about whether that might play a role um, directly as one of the genetic predisposers to preterm labor, and if so, being able to then maybe use that in a preventative way by identifying women particularly at risk for preterm labor. Our future studies, as I mentioned, this genome-wide association, we're in the process of trying to do that now. And then with John Daigle, who's a neonatologist our, at our group, we're interested in looking at all the three-letter abbreviations that neonatologists love. So patent ductus arteriosus, retinopathy of prematurity, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, necrotizing enterocolitis, interventricular hemorrhages, and periventricular leukomalacia. And John's in the process of doing some analysis on, on those right now. Uh, okay, the last couple of minutes. So this is the um, sermon part of this. So that's the sermon, and one of the, the last test is in here too. So if you can hang in here for a couple more minutes. I've been, as I said earlier on, I, I've just been, I mean, I really have been incredibly lucky. I have like a job that I really like. I get to go on wonderful trips to cool places like Kentucky. Actually, I should say that I've been to Kentucky twice in my life. The first time I was here was the only time, despite growing up in Buffalo, New York, that I've had to pull off of a highway because a blizzard was too bad to continue on in. And so I'm here for the second time and there's another snowstorm. So my, my stereotype of Kentucky is certainly that you guys have the worst weather in the United States. Um, even though sometimes Iowa weather is bad too. So anyway, I've been really lucky to do this and um, I think if I've learned anything it's that there is this constant um, juxtaposition between how cool our science is and how exciting it is for investigators like me and I know many of you in the room to do our experiments and we should do them and we are hopefully going to make the world better. Um, at the same time we want to find ways that we can apply them directly to our patients and then ultimately as I'll show um, being able to have them applied to other uh, patient populations as well. Um, this is the Mayon volcano. It was in the news uh, last week when there was another fourth typhoon this year in the Philippines and the sides of this washed down and killed several thousand people in the villages that are down at the base of this in the Philippines. So although it's a spectacularly beautiful tropical country, um, they're really troubled by lots of issues of um, poverty and so on. Um, this is one roll of film back when you still used film to take pictures, this is about 15 years old now, that I shot in about 90 minutes one morning as I saw um, these 36 people out of a group of about 450 that I saw over a course of two days who came in who had unrepaired cleft lip and palate. And while some of these people are fairly young, you might even see a kid this young in the U.S., you won't see any guys this age or lots of these other ages as well. And they just don't have money to get their cleft lip and palate repaired there. And so it's a huge problem for them as individuals, even if not the biggest problem facing the Philippines today. And I was really overwhelmed by this, I think, the first few times I went. And so a couple of the parents that I'll show have, have uh, encouraged me to present this to other people so that as much as we're enjoying our own individual lives, we can always remember that there are some folks who have it amazingly worth off, worse off than we do and that we need to think about them as well. So this is a real slide. If you can afford to have surgery in the Philippines, you have to <clears throat> pay for the blood that's going to be used in the transfusion and it really is collected in that little hut and they do type it so you get A, B, A, B or O but they don't test it for anything else so you can imagine in a country that's got hepatitis rates of 10 or 15 percent that that's not such a great thing. This is a little kid that I saw um, also who had uh, what turned out to be a bilateral retinal blastoma. Um, she'd been enucleated on the one side but you can see from the white that it's progressed to the other side and you know this is a completely curable cancer you know in our country you hardly ever see children die of this disorder anymore and we could offer that dad um, a, a bottle of Tylenol with codeine which was about all that we could really um, give to him. This dad um, asked me to show this picture when I asked him if I took it. He asked me to show the picture. So he's um, bagging his child um, who's a couple years old who came in with sepsis and who actually died the day after this picture was taken. And the dad's serving as the ventilator and he's serving as the ventilator because ventilators in this hospital cost four dollars a day to rent and he didn't have the four dollars a day so he spent day and night at the bedside of his child ventilating the child and for those of you who 
are involved in ventilating. You can imagine the quality of the ventilation that's delivered by an unskilled parent who's been awake for 30 hours and is trying to guess at whether they're doing it right. And I've many times on rounds in the Philippines walked into um, a nursery like this in the morning to find a parent asleep at the bedside, hand on an Ambu bag and a dead baby in the um, bed. And this dad said, you know, to let people know that not everybody has uh, the resources that we do, even for what, things that we think are quite routine. Uh, this child, I, I won't quiz you on this. I, may, maybe I will. Anybody? So this is the third quiz. Anybody know what this baby has? As a guess? Uh, close. Tetanus. Uh, so this baby has tetanus. They have uh, wards still in the Philippines for tetanus because neonatal tetanus is so common. Most of the births take place in rural areas where there's no proper cord care. And so these kids are dying of tetanus pretty regularly. So here's the second or the third quiz now, I guess. So um, raise your hand if you know what a tenrec is and would be willing to tell us. What's that? Nobody? So, uh, so I'll have to add this. I'll make this 900 now, I guess, or 850. So I've asked about almost 1,000 people in audiences like this, medical professionals, grad students, et cetera. Um, it's one of the organisms that was uh, sequenced by the Human Genome Project. They spent $20 million on it to, get, to develop the sequence of it for comparative purposes. It's a thing that looks kind of like a hedgehog that lives in Madagascar, and it's an outgroup in sort of the primate tree. Um, this next year, there will be close to a million kids who are going to die from tetanus, measles, pertussis, H flu, hepatitis B, all the things that you guys immunize your patients for. Uh, just last year, the WHO estimated that if we spent a billion dollars a year for the next 10 years, so $10 billion in total, that we could save 10 million lives of children from preventable disorders like measles or tetanus. So the amount that we spent on the TENREC, that none of you smart people knew what it was, but your taxes paid to have it sequenced, would have saved 10,000 lives. And I would guess you would be hard pressed to find the mother of even one of those 10,000 kids who would have been willing to tell you to say that, yeah, you should have sequenced the TENREC instead of you know, providing immunizations for me, and my, me or my child. So there's these huge discrepancies in how funding is spent, and I'm not for a minute suggesting that the NIH budget should suddenly be converted into immunizations, although that wouldn't be the worst thing that could happen. Um, and certainly someone like myself who's been enormously blessed and dependent on NIH funding, um, it would certainly uh, change my life. But I think we at least have to think about the political ramifications of how this health funding and lots of other kinds of federal and state funding is spent and to take that into account in the calculus on the kinds of things that we do. Uh, I tried to mention the people who did the primary work as I went along. I mean, all of this is work that was done by other people. I'm incredibly lucky to have smart collaborators and for you young people, that's the key to success. Work with people who work harder than you and are smarter than you and that's what, basically what I've done for 20 years. And then uh, one of my kids and my wife down in the corner, my wife got me involved in pediatrics. I grew up in a family where going to medical school was not something that you ever would have imagined possible. So she was the one that got me involved in it. So I'm really thankful to her. And I'm going to stop and take questions. And I'm going to leave one slide that you can read on your own. And thank you.